Hi, I'm Mike Asnold, and welcome to the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge's AC23 Plus Artist Legacy Series podcast. This is a series where we talk to artists who are doing amazing things in the areas of the arts, including performance, education, production, as well as arts advocacy. We record this series in the Virginia and John Nolan Black Box Studio, as well as in the Jan and Bill Grimes Recording Studio here at the Cary Siraj Community Arts Center. Be sure to visit artsbr.org for more information on all the great things we are doing here at the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge. Hope you enjoyed the podcast series and thanks for tuning in.
go. Bravo, Maestro. Bravo to you. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to welcome all of our AC23 Plus listeners and viewers to another installation of our Artist Legacy series put on here by the Arts Council of Baton Rouge, Greater Baton Rouge. That's a mouthful. And today is my distinct pleasure of having an old friend, mentor, amazing pianist. Let me go down the list. This might take a <laughs> while. Pianist, composer, arranger, um, educator. Um, what am I leaving out? Uh, it, it, all things music. I mean, you know, and to this day, I, I continue to get inspiration from Dr. Willis Deloney. Thank you for being Thank here, Thank you, Willis. Mike. Thank you very much. And thanks for starting off the show with some music. How Absolutely. fun was that? It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it, no, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Intimidating. Intimidating. No, no, no. You know, we're talking about my teacher for, uh, for several years and, as I said, continues to be my teacher. So, well, um, um, And I learned from you. You don't, you don't, you don't have to lie you, on this no, thing. No. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learn from all my students, too, and, it, and especially people like you. Uh, you're inspiring too, so this is great. It's great um, to get together. Absolutely, and this is actually the first one we've done in this series where we have two pianos, so I'm excited mm -hmm. about this. Yes. Um, well, before we kind of get into the weeds, because uh, there's so many things I'd like to talk about and um, get into, for our listeners, I want them to know, because you won't say this, but I will, because I don't want to leave these things out. Uh, so Willis uh, is a board professor of piano and jazz studies at the school of, LSU School of Music. Um, you've been on faculty there since 2000, That's right. is that correct? Now, prior to that, you were at Southeastern, Southeastern right? from 1986 to 2000. Okay. And before okay. that, I taught a year in Mississippi at Delta State University. You've been doing this a long time, man. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing it a while, <laughs> a few minutes. <laughs> That's why you're so good at it. Uh, in addition, uh, let's see, other accolades. So um, he received the Artist Fellowship Award uh, from the Louisiana Division of the Arts, the Edith Kirkpatrick Arts Leadership Award given by the Baton Rouge Symphony Orchestra, um, LSU Distinguished Faculty Award in 2019, SEC Professor of the Year uh, at LSU in 2020. That's a lot. Um, that just means you're really, really good. <laughs> well, I've been around for a while, maybe, you know. Well, okay, so uh, one of the goals in this whole thing for me is to sort of augment or just bring out qualities, uh, focus on artists, especially who have a, a connection, roots uh, to South Louisiana, and maybe more acutely Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. And you certainly fit into that category. So mm -hmm. tell, me, let me, tell me how it started, like the formative years, getting into music and so forth. Mm -hmm. I grew up, in my earliest years as a young boy, <clears throat> were actually in North Louisiana. Okay. My family's roots are in Ruston, yeah. North Louisiana, Lincoln Parish. We lived in Caldwell Parish, which is, uh, old timers might remember Governor John McKithen. Mm, yeah. That's where he's from, that's where we lived for a while, and that's where I picked up the piano. That's where I started playing the piano. I was five or six, there was a piano in the house. My, my older brother was studying piano. We had teachers uh, both in the area, and eventually I went to Monroe, mm -hmm. which was like 30 miles away, to study with a teacher there. So I started playing the piano when I was very young, picking out tunes by ear, um, which is a great, uh, I think, a great help for me because I've never been intimidated or reluctant to improvise right. or to, to, you know, to use these. But at the same time, I, I learned the notes and the spaces at the same time, so I was always reading or you know, doing things right. extemporaneously. So in that respect, I was extremely fortunate to... to have that in my house, in my home, in a, you know. And it was encouraged? Uh, oh, of course it was in encouraged, especially by uh, my parents. My mother in particular made sure that I had good piano teachers. I grew up in a very tiny town. I played piano in the church, you know, that Baptist church. You don't have to follow the notes all the time. You can improvise. Right. Were you playing piano? or I was playing the piano. Okay. I was playing, and I started doing it when I was six. Okay. So playing in church at six? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that kind of background is it's kind of rare anymore because uh, it, you know young kids don't grow up taking piano lessons, learning to read, playing in churches the way I did, or doing other things like it did. So 
that was way back then, yeah. That was over 60 years ago we're talking. But mm -hmm. I had good teachers. We moved to Baton Rouge when I was uh, 11 years old. Okay. And that's where I hooked up with uh, one of the best piano teachers who ever lived. Her name was Saluda Little. I don't know that name. Her, her husband, he had passed away by the time I met her. He was a former professor at LSU. His name was Carlton Little. But I started studying with her, and that's when the really seriousness of purpose about the piano, I think, took off. You know, learning the instrument well, but learning deeply about music in general, too. Hmm. It was a classical study, but she encouraged all the other stuff. She encouraged... Were you, you, other stuff, like, uh, were you like just learning things on the radio? Yes, yes, kind of, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like probably you did. Like mm -hmm. I know you did. I listened yeah. to tunes on the radio, learned to play them. Popular tunes of the day. I loved, about that time, piano-centered popular music sure. was starting to be a thing. Carol King, Elton John, Billy Joel, Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Yeah. So I learned all those tunes by ear, but you could also pick up sheet music uh, back in those days at Did music you stores. You know, listen to Chicago and Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which were really, really... Uh, crucial influences on me when I realized we're, you know, popular music can also kind of go this way into certain jazz-influenced right. textures and right. ideas. So, so, you know, that, that hit my ears really hard, and it right. piqued my interest. As, and by the time I got to high school, like a lot of people, like you, like many others, started playing in the jazz ensemble at school. And was that sort of your first exposure to jazz? Yes. Okay. My first exposure to jazz, well, what I thought was jazz was, um, like a lot of people think, I, was, I had recordings of Rhapsody in Blue at my house when I was a young boy. Mm -hmm. And when I grow up, I want to play Rhapsody in Blue. And also Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto and things like that. But I thought, like a lot of people, that Rhapsody in Blue, okay, that's weird. That's Sure. That's some jazz there. Right. It's not, but it's a very important link, sure. you know. And, mm -hmm. and I played Rhapsody in Blue ten dozen times. I'm playing it this week, as a matter right. of fact. So, but only in high school did I realize, oh, there's something else going in here. There are people out there like Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans. So, well, who were the popular pianists of the day at that point? Like, you know, internationally, would that have been? I think that was probably guys? one of the peak popularity in the early to mid 70s Oscar Peterson was yeah. probably the household name that everybody knew um, Errol Garner was still alive yeah. uh, he, he was on television a lot uh, I got into Bill Evans a little bit later it was a little it was very cerebral stuff of course it's very deep and I didn't really understand it initially until I got to college and, and that's when I realized okay I, I've got to get into this too mm -hmm. But Oscar Peterson, is the, Oscar Peterson is the reason I wanted to learn to play piano. Yeah. I figured, man, that's great. I'll never have those chops, but I want to swing like that. Right. Oh, man, I felt yeah. something deep, and I want to learn how to swing like that. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Like, when people talk about Oscar Peterson, the first thing that comes up is the, the technique, oh, the yeah. chops. And they, they, they associate him with Art Tatum and that, that whole stride tradition. But a lot of people don't talk about what you just mentioned. It's like that sense of swing mm -hmm. was just really Yeah, something. I'm just, you know, putting the notes right where they belong, right. inside the pulse. And it could be on top of the pulse or behind it or right square dab in the middle. And right. it took me years to be able to articulate why that was valuable to me. But I knew I felt something there that I wanted. Right. And I knew that you know, this is not easy either. It's going to take a while, but it was worth investigating. And then, then I went from there. Well, so I'm curious with that. Um, as you're investigating Oscar Peterson, was that a combination of trying to pick things out by ear as well as, I know for me, it was, you know, um, it was very much Bill Evans, but then looking at the transcriptions as mm -hmm. well, yeah. kind of comparing notes or that kind of thing. Didn't look as had a lot of transcriptions early on, as many as I do now, and of course done my own transcriptions as you do and others like us. Um, it was certain recordings that just uh, were very important. Oscar Peterson in Russia, for example, was the album, the album that 
that got me going. Yeah. But then I started listening to to others, and I started realizing, oh, there's there's this guy named Winton Kelly out there. Mm. Another feel. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, it, everything feels just right. Uh, there's there's something there that I I want to understand. And I was starting to play gigs with people here in Baton Rouge when I was uh, in my early college years. And they were steeped in that value system, too. Well, so Swing describe hard. that to me. Yeah. Like, just the scene in Baton Rouge at that time. Yeah. Like, who were some of the influences and the well, experience you Well, you'll did? recognize these names. Uh, I played in a big band. It was called the Buddy Lee Orchestra. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, run by a guy named Buddy Boudreau and his partner, Lee Forche, yeah. the legendary jazz educator, trumpet player, former member of the Woody Herman Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew how deeply you needed to study swing feel to get it right. And he knew how to convey that to his students. He was, you know, he was from the old guard. He was very tyrannical and profane. Right. Yeah. But people loved him. And I learned you a lot. You loved him or you hated him? <laughs> or, you, or you were frightened to death of him. Right, right. <laughs> but I, I learned to uh, value what he was trying to, I heard him play it, of course, and, you know. And he was not in, at his peak when I started playing with him. But... It was all about, it was all about the feel. Mm -hmm. It was all about swinging hard. Uh, all the parts needed to mesh together. Then I started thinking, okay. There was this guy named Count Basie who had a rather famous rhythm section. Right. They knew where to put everything in the yeah. right place too. It was, right. So I, I guess my jazz education really didn't really take off until I started playing with some people who knew what they were doing. Sure. You know? Yeah. I had just had kind of that superficial knowledge. I could improvise. I could sort of swing. And, you know, I could play some bossa novas. I could play some rock and roll tunes. And mm -hmm. yeah. My repertoire was growing, so that was good. Hey, yeah. You mentioned um, Bill Evans, and I'm curious because I sort of I missed that chapter, if you will, of his brother being a predominant figure in, mm. in Baton Rouge at the time. Okay. Um, but so as a result of him being around, was there sort of like a, th a thing about Bill Evans in Baton Rouge? There was, and I didn't appreciate initially. Um, Harry Evans was the supervisor of music in the Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge Parish School System, yeah. of which Zachary High School was a part. That's where I was going to school. And I actually met Harry one time. And... Um, I played for him. I played Watermelon Man, Herbie Hancock. That's that's my current favorite musician oh, yeah, yeah. of all kind. Yeah, you know it doesn't matter. He's the he's the greatest. But I learned to play uh, Watermelon Man, and I played it for him. And you know I thought I was hot stuff. I didn't really understand the Evans uh, legacy at right. that point. And this was mid seventies, early seventies, and I didn't realize until later that Harry was also a powerful musician himself. You understand I mean, he was quite a pianist. He was quite a pianist. He was not in his brother's league, but he was a very, very bright, um, deep, thoughtful musical mm -hmm. person, just like Bill. Yeah. And later I understood, okay, this is, this is significant stuff. And, um, of course, Harry's daughter is Debbie, as in Waltz for Debbie, sure, yeah. you know, who grew up just a couple of blocks from my wife. No kidding. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so and maybe it was the connection was uh, preordained somehow. Yeah. But I really got serious about Bill Evans in my later college years, and for a while was re you know rather obsessed with trying to figure out this idiom and how it could maybe inform what I wanted to do. No, I'm curious because I know um, from our conversations and uh, and also from a concert you did recently here at the Arts Council, your deep love of Debussy's music. Yes. And I, I'm just wondering, do you feel like that's a connection? Because obviously Bill was very influenced by the, the, the Impressionistic mm -hmm. composers, especially Debussy and Ravel. Yeah. It, it, you think that is part yeah, of the I, reason I, you're attracted to it? I have no reason to doubt that, because I've always loved Debussy. And in the very first public recital I gave as a young boy, I had Debussy was on the program. So mm -hmm. I've been, he's followed me around for a long time. And you can feel and sense that connection between those composers and Bill Evans' mm -hmm. art, the way he treats the piano. You know, it's not just a chord that he might play. It's uh, how he brings out. Yeah, the real 
voice. Not just the, playing the all the notes. That's really pretty, but that's better. Yeah. yeah. Or piano voicing in physical in physical terms, and that's something he learned from his classical study right. at Southeastern. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of people. A lot of people yeah. may not realize yeah. he studied in South Louisiana. Yeah. So there was an embrace of the instrument in, in its entire history, not just its jazz history. But it, Oscar was doing that too. But his his idiom was something else. Right. But if you listen to him carefully, especially playing ballads, it's exquisite mm -hmm. touch, you know, and voicing and careful sound production. Well, so like. Keep me going here. So then you you finished high school and you go on to study where? Well, I went to LSU. Okay. Um, I got my first two degrees there. Um, studied with a great teacher, Jack Gary, mm -hmm. who um, he was a genius, genius teacher. Didn't do jazz, but did not necessarily discourage it either, right. you know. And he understood that I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> and I spent a year in Baltimore at the Peabody Conservatory, studied with a great pianist, Ann Shine. She was uh, one of the best Chopin players in the world. Mm -hmm. It just blew me away. So I, I was with her for a year and came back and did my doctorate at LSU. Yeah. Yeah. And when you came back to do your doctorate, what, did, what was your focus for your doctorate? Well, it, it, I have a DMA in piano performance, so it was a classical degree. I had to do a series of recitals. And my final thesis was on Rhapsody in Blue, actually. It was a, it was a jazz analysis. It was the very first jazz-oriented thesis project at, at LSU. So. Yeah. Awesome. And, and Dr. Gary, my professor, approved it. And he said, but you're going to have to make sure I understand everything you're talking about when you're finished. <laughs> so he was really hard on me. But I learned how to, to do that kind of project. I learned how to write better right. and explain myself better. Mm. Yeah. So in that respect, uh, it was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this seems like a good good spot. I'm going to ask you, um, if you would, to play a, a solo piece. Oh, sure. And, I'd love to. and what, what are you going to play? Well, I've chosen something by my dear friend Joe Macholm. Um, those who are familiar with my recordings know that I've been recording and playing his music for a long time. And he's recently completed a series of pieces that he calls Standards and Improvisations. Mm -hmm. The standards are newly composed like piano character pieces based on the chord progression of old standards. Gotcha. The one I'm going to play for you today is based on the touch of your lips. Beautiful tune. Yeah. Yeah. The improvisations are not improvised except they're unedited. So I had to choose the articulations, dynamics, tempo, and other. Gotcha. But all the notes are there. In the piece that I'm going to play for you today, there is a section in the middle for improvisation. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just play a chorus of the improvisation because I want to make sure that the listeners get an impression of this great compositional um, approach. Absolutely. Because to play this well, you got to be, be a jazz musician, I think. But you need to know your Brahms and your Debussy <laughs> and your Chopin and your Beethoven for, you know, pianistic niceties and, and details. Uh, Joe's the best at this, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, before you start, I'm going to step out of the picture and let you. All have right. This. So the the title of this piece is "The Things You've Lost."
great piece. Yeah, it's yeah. gorgeous. And you can certainly hear the uh, touch of your lips in there. It's unmistakable. <laughs> Um, and tell me again the composer. Joe Macomb, M-A-K-H-O-L-M. And is he He he's lives in Paris. Paris. Okay. He's from Wisconsin, but he's lived in Paris for 40 years plus now. He's, uh, in fact, he teaches uh, a little bit at the Bill Evans Academy in Paris. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay. It's wow. the only place in the world that's licensed to use Bill Evans' name in their teaching academy. I so did not know that. I played a little recital there a few years ago. Yeah. Joe's a master. He, he's able to put it on the page... And for us who are jazz musicians, no, I mean, okay, that's the way it's written down. <laughs> right, right. Well, okay, so college is over and career starts. Yeah. Um, so take me through that. And, and I want to make sure that we get to, with you it's a little difficult because you, you have so many irons in the fire, not just a pianist, but yeah. composer, arranger, educator, obviously. So go take me down those lanes. Well... After college, you know, it's time to get a job, you know. I'm married, uh, my wife and I both need to work. We've got two kids. The job at Delta State opens up and I, I, I get the job. Um, I stay there only a year. The job at Southeastern opens up, which ultimately fit me pretty well. They hired me to run the jazz program and teach piano, which is what I love doing. Um, by that time, shortly after that, we had three kids. Um, plot thickens. The plot thickens. <laughs> and I think right about that time I met you. You know, I was there for 14 years. Yeah. We lived here in Baton Rouge. I remember I, you first getting that job. Yeah, yeah. I was um, commuting, but it, it worked out just fine. So I did that and uh, started to get a, a bit of a performing career going where I was traveling just a little bit, um, not too much because our kids were young, you know, and just the reality of that. Uh, and then in 2000, the job opened up at LSU. And they let me come back. <laughs> and uh, kind of full circle. Yes, yeah, right? sure. Yeah. And at that point, of course, it's it's a it's a great place to work. It's a great place to you know the, the LSU name is good. Mm -hmm. It's imprint. The imprint is good. So I started traveling a lot more. Uh, I started doing a lot of writing for a group called Five by Design. That's right. Yeah. Uh, jazz vocal group and starting to meet conductors and other musicians out there and started playing concerts uh, around the country, a bit of traveling, went to China, I went to, been to Europe several times, Argentina and Brazil, yeah. you yeah. know. But that, the LSU connection has helped with that kind of visibility though, because it, it you know, it has credibility. Kids were grown, so I was able to, to travel a, bit, a little bit more without mm -hmm. worrying about dumping it all on Drisha right, <laughs> to take right, care sure, of, sure. you know. Uh, and now they're all gone. We have grandkids now, so you know we're free. And I'm still playing a lot, especially this semester while I'm on sabbatical, playing a lot. And my wife's able to go with me, so we're having a pretty good time. New chapter. Yeah, it's great. We're having a good time, and um, I'll be ready to get back to the classroom in the spring. But it, I was able to take on a number of performing projects mm -hmm. this fall. Yeah. Didn't have to say no, you know, right. because I, otherwise right. I would have missed too much class. No, I'm curious about the, um, um, you mentioned arranging yeah. uh, for Five by Design, and as well as I, obviously you composed because uh -huh. we played one of your pieces. I failed to mention when we first started, what was the name of the piece that we started with? It's called A Little Lift. Original composition. Original composition based on an, an, the old tune My Romance, the old Rodgers and Hart right. tune. Which I heard a little quote in there. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wrote it a few years ago for a, actually for a concert, an online concert that the Baton Rouge Symphony produced during the pandemic. It was an online televised concert, and I wrote this tune for um, Brian Shaw and John Madera to play with me. Yeah. And uh, casting them out for a title, I, I chose a little lift because it seemed to be what we needed at that time. And right, right. happy little tune. Uh, so there you go. Well, as far as the you know the the skill sets of composing and arranging is is that. Was there formal training in that, or that just you know came from you you just diving in and doing it? Uh, a lot of diving in and doing it. You know you know oh, what that's I know like. All about that, yeah. I did have a fantastic arranging teacher in LSU. His name was John Edmonds, mm -hmm. and he taught me some of the ins and outs of both like big band arranging, how to you know some certain things about 
voicings and distributions, those nerdy kind of things that sure. you typically typically get wrong when you try to do it on your own. Right. And um, he helped me through my my first chart, mm -hmm. which I which wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, Deloney, nothing sounds quite as bad as your first chart. <laughs> he denied saying that to me, but he said that to me. And, and the next chart was much better. You know, he showed me what was wrong and how we could fix it. Mm -hmm. Then I started getting, uh, you know, got some work going, some projects, and started doing some jingle work here in Baton Rouge right. back, back right. when that was a thing here in, in, in town. Kind of an industry that's... Kind of no longer. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I met a great guy, Joey Decker, yeah, uh, who's, I still say he's got some of the best ears in the business. Yeah. He, he could hear anything and know how to convey what he needed. And uh, so I learned a lot about arranging, especially Quick for deadlines. strings. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, the client comes in, you, we want this jingle. Uh, it's 8 o'clock this morning. We need it tonight. Right. I've done that. You've right. done that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's kind of stimulating when you have that. It makes things start to flow. <laughs> well, one thing it taught me, too, was the, uh, the art of, yes, you bring yourself to the table and your skill set, but ultimately it's not yours. You're writing for someone else's vision. And That's that, right. that can be humbling sometimes. When, yeah. uh, I heard a funny story by Jeff Rona, the composer for film, and he has a great story about this. He's like, yeah, you know, you write this thing and you put your heart into it. And the client comes in and says, yeah, th that's great. Could we take out this, take out that? Mm -hmm. And he said, by the end, it's just a dog whistle. And they say, what do you think? He's like, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. I mean, it's... You, you hope, though, you, you, you don't like those moments, uh -huh. and they're, you hopefully they're far and few between, but... <laughs> and as much as I dislike that at times, it's, I learned how to do things that have allowed me to do my own thing now. Sure. You know, yeah. now I just write things for myself. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> uh, but I have some technique to fall back on that I learned in the trenches. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny when you talk about, you know, having great teachers, too, because I remember I studied a long time with, uh, and I'm sure you knew him, uh, Dr. Burt Bro. Yes, yes. Orchestration, that kind of thing. And I just remember those lessons where I'd throw something working on a score, orchestral thing, and I'd put it up there, and almost every time it'd be like, this would be his look. <laughs> and then yes. I, knew I was going to learn something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mentioned Five Mind Design. I was one of their arrangers. Another arranger that worked for them was a guy named Lovell Ives, a master arranger. And occasionally he would see some of the things that I wrote, and mm. he would ask me, well, Why'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to make sure that I was in his uh, wheelhouse because mm -hmm. he was their first arranger and I wanted to make sure my stuff was meshing with their their thing. So he showed me a few things that I was doing wrong too. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, let's get back to the playing because one thing that you've uh, I've always admired about you that you don't see a lot of people doing um, is really, like I've, I've seen a, quite a few guys come through the classical tradition and then if they're going to play jazz, they end up playing jazz. Mm -hmm. And they, they might dabble with classical every now and then, but it's they're jazz players. Yeah. But you've really managed to keep up both, like on a very high level, and you do a lot of concertizing, like based yeah. on that, yes. and the relationships between classical and jazz. So, I mean, just tell me about that world and what that means to you. Um, I have to circle back to my academic employment. I was allowed to do both things, first of all. I was not told that you have to do one or the other, which oftentimes will happen in, sure. in academia. But especially at LSU, I've been encouraged to do both things and to cultivate that. And as a result, occasionally I get students who want both things. Mm -hmm. They want to do both things. They want to understand how high they can go in both idioms. And, and I've had some great students, Certainly you know, like yeah. Oscar Rossignoli, yeah. Ronald yeah. Rodriguez, yeah. virtuoso classical players, virtuoso jazz players. Yeah. Um, so I know it's possible, and I know there are people out there besides myself who are doing this kind of thing. And being in an academic setting, it's the perfect place to cultivate that and pursue that. Mm -hmm. and, and over the years, I play, I've been playing recitals for, for God knows how long, but all my recitals feature both idioms, sometimes a, say a sonata by Beethoven, a piece by Chopin, or something by Joe Macomb. 
and then maybe just some tunes, right? just some straight-ed tunes, and then I may play a tune by Billy Joel or Carole King at the right. end. Um, right. That's what I enjoy doing, and that, you know, people want to hear it. Some people still want to hear that kind of thing, and um, so that's allowed me to kind of keep my dual interests alive without the feeling I, well, I got to do one or the other. What was the piece uh, you did recently at a concert here uh, with uh, Dr. Bill Grimes? A uh, long time. Well, the, the whole point of that yeah. concert was to celebrate. How long you guys been working? Forty years. Yeah. Wow. Let me grab my water. Yeah, forty years. And the last piece of the concert, uh, you did a thing. Was it a Jobin piece? Yes, a jo Jobin piece called Jinji. Jinji. Yeah. yeah. But you really tied it into the WC influence, and it was just I really really enjoyed that because the. In, in a, a Willis Deloney way, uh, towards the end, I, if I'm remembering right, you did a cadenza, and it's, I'm thinking a lot of it was improvised, but it sounded so Debussy, like you could hear the influence, oh, it's yeah. so obvious, yeah, but, yeah. but brilliant, well, that's my point. Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, I've been working on, con I've been consciously working through all of Debussy's piano music for the last dozen years or so, and it's all, you know, kind of obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, it's going to come out. Right. It, when I improvise and when I'm, Plus, Debussy was a big influence on Jobim. Right. Yeah. Right. And as he was on a lot of composers, Billy Strayhorn, Bill Evans, and, you know, folks like that. And me. <laughs> 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 well, um, talk to me a little bit about just the educational part of things. Like when you're working um, with a pianist, let's say who has an interest in both, <laughs> both worlds, um, how in the world do you approach that like just from a uh, agenda standpoint are, are you are you get simultaneously giving them classical music and jazz and you work on both and we you know, yeah I guess it varies according it to does the, the vary person. if the student is not interested in, in jazz mm -hmm. that's okay if they're interested in the piano I can help them and and that that's one of the non-negotiable elements that we need to consider are you interested in do you love this instrument because mm -hmm. if you do there's this vast history that we can explore together and we'll never run out of stuff mm -hmm. are you primarily a jazz person likewise well do you love the piano well, then we've got some things going but there are also pieces that will inform your jazz playing that um, like Debussy pieces but also certain Chopin and uh, other classicists uh, Spanish music and whatnot things that will connect you to what you're trying to do as a jazz pianist, not just a thumper, but a true, right. a true artist of the instrument. Yeah. So it, yeah, it varies greatly. And then some students, they, they want to do it all. And there's not, a, there's not enough time in the lesson to cover it all. And that's fine too. Well, I'm curious, because you're talking about, uh, in, in large degree, maybe the jazz pianist that has some classical influence mm -hmm. and, you know, the study of the instrument mm -hmm. especially, because the classical repertoire will obviously bring that out in your playing. That's right. But vice versa, like, do you find um, the primary classical pianist, let's say that maybe doesn't have a jazz background at all. Um, uh, wh what's my question here? It, it, if you do have a jazz background, what do you think that brings to the classical approach to playing? I think it brings a certain kind of innate flexibility, sensitivity to rhythm that may not always be there with somebody that doesn't involve themselves in inherently rhythmic music all the time. Right, right. There's always a concern with you know, the groove. Mm -hmm. I use that term with my students all the time. You know, this Rachmaninoff piece, it needs to have a groove. It's not just how loud and how fast you can play it. Because that kind of is a reality, like, you know, someone, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're primary classical pianist and you primarily play pieces by yourself, if you're not playing chamber music. Yeah. Because we both know when you play with the rhythm section, that really sort of f helps you form, formulate uh, an agreement. Yes. With the people around you. Absolutely. And an understanding of rhythm. And if, and a lot of classical pianists, they don't play enough chamber music because that will reveal your shortcomings too. When sure. you start hooking up with a violinist and a cellist or whatever, you realize there's, there are other responsibilities here. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it is rhythmic. Yeah. It is the, the, the ensemble things that we learn as jazz players. We, you know, we learn them playing a 
my Brahms trio too. <clears throat> but yeah, classically trained pianists oftentimes lose sight, I think, of that um, aspect. You know, I say, listen to Rachmaninoff play his pieces. Listen to um, Horowitz play the pieces. You feel that groove? Right. And it's always locked in. There's right. always a pocket mm -hmm. of that sort. Right. It's not the same kind of pocket that Oscar Peterson creates, but it's there. Right. It's fundamentally strong and undeniable. Mm -hmm. And don't get blinded by the speed and the, the you know, the physical stuff that's going on. Right. Because right. ultimately, that's just part of it. And, and the young players need that. They need that physical release sometimes because mm -hmm. they're, you know they're full of, full of energy and and. and um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out this balance between students, but they're, you know, they're all different. They all have varying interests. It's kind of like on a spectrum, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I've yet to find one that wasn't interested, at least in learning to appreciate jazz, right. or vice versa, a jazz player that wasn't interested in learning to appreciate that classical music because of this. Yeah. The instrument is well, so like wonderful. It's such I a mean, history it's to it. such so wonderful. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, so uh, before we kind of play our listeners out, if uh, you yeah. will, um, what's going on now? Like, what are you excited about right now? Well, I'm excited. This semester has been really fun. I just got back from Paris, did three concerts there, or three different programs. How cool is that? I mean, not, uh, not a lot of people can gig. say that. <laughs> <laughs> I played a solo recital in a, in a private residence, and it was the classic Parisian salon setting mm -hmm. hosted by the the guy that runs TikTok in France. You know, so okay. a lot of the hoi polloi were there. Yeah. Then I did a jazz trio gig. And then I did a two piano jazz concert with my friend Joe Macomb. Yes. In fact, yeah. we played this tune, a little lift together. Yeah. Did some of his arrangements, some of my other stuff. And, uh, and tomorrow I'm leaving for Lansing, Michigan. Where I'm the guest artist with the Lansing Symphony Orchestra and I'm playing the jazz concerto for piano and orchestra by Greg Yasinitsky. It was written for me. Okay. Uh, we, we premiered it here in Baton Rouge seven years ago with Tim Muffet, oh, yeah. who is now, he retired from the Baton Rouge Symphony, but he's the conductor in Lansing. Okay. So he's invited me up there to, to play this piece with him, and I'm also doing the Rhapsody in Blue, <laughs> which <laughs> Rhapsody in Blue helped put my kids through college. <laughs> so I love that piece. Yay for Gershwin. Yay, go Gershwin. <laughs> 100th anniversary of Rhapsody in Blue. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that sounds exciting. So that, that's it. And um, next week, I'm going to Vermont to play a, a jazz recital, a jazz concert on an art series there in Manchester, Vermont. And then I'm doing a recital with uh, a violinist friend of mine, it's mostly a classical recital, some um, violin piano sonatas by a great composer that we know, Stephen Dankner. Oh, yeah. He used yeah. to teach at NOCA. Mm hmm. Uh, he's a fabulous yeah. composer, and my violinist friend, Joanna Ganova, she's, she's amazing. We just released an album of his sonatas uh, not too long ago, so we're in the process of promoting it. Now, you know I have to ask. I mean, if you're going to Vermont and you're going to play jazz, are you going to play? No, we're not going <laughs> to play that tune. <laughs> I think they might. I just, I just had to do it. <laughs> the, the audience might go, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> We're over it. <laughs> Moonlight in Vermont. Okay, sure. <laughs> well, look, um, Willis, I really appreciate you oh, being thank here. Thank you, Mike. I've been what a pleasure. forward to making this happen, and, and it finally did, so thank you. Thank you. And um, so what are we going to play the audience out on? You brought in a tune. I brought in a little tune called Caught on a Breeze. And tell me about this one. This is actually based on an old melody from ancient times, from the Renaissance era. We don't know who wrote the theme, but it's been adopted by various classical composers over the years. Uh, Rachmaninoff used it in a set of piano variations. But um, it struck me that this could probably work as a kind of a sultry bossa nova kind of setting. Yeah. So that's what we're gonna do. The theme is called La Folia which means folly or madness. Okay. But we're, we're not gonna be, it's not gonna be that. 
You don't know. It could it, be it madness. Could be, it could be sheer <laughs> folly in the end, but it's called Caught on a Breeze. A nice, gentle, little, simple thing with some pretty chords and see what happens. Now, you're going you're gonna to do it. I'm going to start. Right. Yeah, what you'll hear first is the original theme with some very simple triadic harmonies, and then I'll juice it up a little bit. I have no doubt. And then yeah. we'll set up a little vamp and go from there. See you at the end. See you at the end, man. <laughs>
The Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge would like to acknowledge our generous sponsors, the Shell Corporation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, and the City of Baton Rouge.